in the on-again, off-again trade war. What does it mean for Nebraska? Grow deeper as we explore what it means for Nebraska's number one industry. Plus, where does the president stand on ethanol? Nebraska farmers want to know. And why pig farmers and cattle ranchers team up, hoping for a vaccine bank for foot and mouth disease? It's time to grow. pushback from rural America, President Trump defends his trade policy, saying farmers are going to win. But many in agriculture urging him to drop the standoff on trade. And that's our top story. In the midst of a possible trade war, the president's tough talk raises concerns. It just creates a lot of uncertainty and not not really knowing where we're going to end up on this. Nebraska Farm Bureau President Steve Nelson has been a supporter of President Trump and wants him to get big wins. The president is trying to do some good things, trying to make trade better for farmers and ranchers and really for everyone in the country. But at the same time, we have to be concerned about some of the rhetoric that we hear and how that might affect us negatively in the future. The president started the week with a series of tweets about agriculture. In his words, quote, farmers have not been doing well for 15 years. Mexico, Canada, China, and others have been treated unfairly. By the time I finish trade talks, that will change. Big trade barriers against U.S. farmers and other businesses will finally be broken. Massive trade deficits no longer, end quote. Government numbers show farm income is down, but only the past few years, not the 15 the president claimed. And on trade with Mexico and Canada, U.S. exports have risen dramatically. Producers are, re are reminding me of this all the time. That's why I traveled to Montreal. That's why I traveled to Mexico City. Uh, to, to really tell, I think, a, a good story uh, about American agriculture increasing exports under NAFTA. Farmers say it has real-world consequences. And it causes foreign buyers to look around for other sources in case something happens to their sources here in the U.S. So it continues to be a concern, continues to be a threat, a negative threat towards our markets. Pork producers in the U.S. are speaking out after Mexico levies tariffs. In a press release, the National Pork Producers said the tariffs are in retaliation for tariffs on its metal exports to the United States. A 10% tariff is effective as of Tuesday, which escalates to 20% on July 5th. The National Pork Producers Council president issued a statement saying the toll on rural America from escalating trade disputes with critically important trade partners is mounting. Mexico is U.S. pork's largest export market, representing nearly 25% of all U.S. pork shipments last year. Producers say a 20% tariff eliminates their ability to compete in Mexico. Mexico's decision follows similar retaliation in early April by China, which imposed additional 25% tariffs on U.S. pork, reducing live hog values by as much as $18 an animal on an annualized basis. If you enjoy coffee or a steak, then international trade has affected your life. Trade certainly has been a hot button topic, yet the average resident may not realize how the issue impacts their daily life. To bring the topic into focus, the Lexington Council for Economic Development is sponsoring a trade town hall at 7 p.m. on June 14th at the Lexington Holiday Inn Express Convention Center. Panelists with extensive trade experience will share their stories, including the past president of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, a member of the Ethanol Board, and the retired executive director of the Corn Board. Find the details on that event on our website and mobile app. After negotiating on year-round sales of higher blends of ethanol, the president saying no. The deal would have allowed E15 to be sold year-round. Some ethanol supporters feared the deal would have led to trade issues. Nebraska Congressman Adrian Smith says he's pleased the president backed off from the deal, saying it would have, quote, damaged the administration's commitment to support renewable fuels. We should continue to move forward with E15 year-round, which is good for consumers, retailers, and Nebraska agriculture, end quote. Farmers have been pushing for this E15 deal to get complete for the benefits of corn growers. 
Before the president's apparent decision, folks on both the oil and ethanol sides of the debate were said to be near a compromise. The proposed deal would have allowed higher blends of ethanol to be sold year round, specifically 15 percent ethanol, which certainly would increase demand for corn. We continue always, of course, to be looking for markets for our products. We grow more corn than we use in this country, and so it's important that we find markets, and whether they be uh, through ethanol first and then through livestock, it's important that we develop and grow these markets. Ethanol backers were somewhat leery of a deal that would have attached credits known as RINs to exports of ethanol. Construction wraps on a Nebraska ethanol plant. Flint Hills Resources has a plant in Fairmont, south of York. They're installing a new technology for the dry mill ethanol industry. It produces a high protein animal and fish feed ingredient from a portion of the distiller's grains produced during the ethanol making process. Flint Hills is branding the new product as Nexpro Protein Ingredient. The company expects to start up the new technology later this summer. The project is said to be one of the largest investments in co-product upgrading technologies ever made by a dry mill ethanol manufacturer. Monsanto is now part of Bayer with that acquisition complete. Is the merger good, bad, or otherwise for agriculture? That's the subject of our poll question. Now let's look at the results. Just 12% of you saying it is good for farmers, the rest of you split between bad, mixed, or unsure. Farmers come together to learn ways to improve soil health. NTV's Valerie Juarez reports. They're crops that aren't even harvested. Soil, since soils aren't meant to be bare, this allows us to put a cover on soils when they're not in a cropping se sequence. On Monday, farmers from across Nebraska and other parts of the Midwest came out to learn how to make the most of their cover crops. There's a lot of different uh, tools that we can use. There's a lot of different species and varieties uh, that we can bring to play. And they all have something unique. And so uh, as we start to understand what each of them does, we can start to bring them together in combinations and get multiple benefits in that way. Folks getting the chance to improve their knowledge of cover crop mixes in order to produce healthy soils. I think that uh, when we don't have adequate cover on the soil, that's when we open ourselves up to wind erosion and water erosion, soil compaction from rainfall. Dr. Christine Jones, a soil specialist, traveled all the way to the Cornhusker state from Australia to share her insight about how our soils compare and differ. Like the Australian continent has got the oldest soils of any continent in the world and you've got some of the youngest soils of any continent in the world because it was, you know, recently glaciated. So there's not really very much, there's not very much similar at all about our soils. That couldn't be more different, really. But Jones says it's not necessarily all about the soil. It's all about the plants and if we've got a diversity of plants, then they're going to improve our soil no matter what kind of soil we have. The growing season begins and that brings challenges. One of the issues we've seen is volunteer corn. How much of an issue has it been in your area? Follow Grow on Twitter to cast your votes. Up next, we talk to a national leader in the biofuels industry, and later, why cattle and hog farmers are teaming up.